Okay, hello. My name is Tom Ford. I'm one of the tutors on the Jack Greek Summer School and I'm going to show you quickly how to scan Homer. Syllables in Greek poetry are either short or long. Two short syllables last the same length as a long syllable. And when we scan a line of poetry, we show visually which syllables are short and which are long. Short syllables are denoted like this and long syllables like this and a few syllables can be both short and long. These are called ancaps and we denote them in this way with a cross. In Greek there are two vowels which are naturally short. These are epsilon, the short e, and omicron, short o. And there are two vowels which are naturally long. There's eta, which is a long e, and there's omega, which is a long o. The vowels alpha, iota, and upsilon are in some words short, and in other words long. For example, the word for gold, krusos, the upsilon, is long. Now, you can find that out from a dictionary, but often this isn't actually necessary because you can usually work it out when you're scanning from the other syllables in the line. Now, in Greek, there are also a large number of diphthongs. A diphthong is when two vowels fuse together into one. For example, alpha plus upsilon creates the sound ow, and alpha plus iota the sound ai. These diphthongs are naturally long, although at the end of a word, diphthongs can become shortened by a process that I'll mention later. Now, a short vowel becomes long if it is directly followed by two consonants. For example, in the Greek word for the god Apollo, Apollon, we would say here that the omicron is short by nature, but it becomes long by position because it is followed by two consonants. The two consonants can also be in different words. For example here, the omicron in ton hippon is short because omicron is short by nature and it is followed by only one consonant, not two. By the way, a rough breathing is not a consonant. In ton logon, however, the omicron in ton is again short by nature, like all omicrons, but here it's followed by two consonants, and therefore we would scan the omicron here as being long. In Greek, there are three single letters which are actually double consonants. Look out for these. They are zeta is sigma plus delta, or delta plus sigma. Z here is kappa plus sigma, and psi is pi plus sigma. So therefore, any vowel that's short by nature will be lengthened by position if it is followed by one of these. For example, the Greek word for six, hex, the epsilon, is short by nature, but it's long by position, because it's really hex with two consonants. Okay, now there's one very important and very common exception to this rule, that a vowel that is short by nature is lengthened by position before two consonants. And this is the mute and liquid rule. And the mute and liquid rule means that a vowel that's short by nature can stay short or it can be lengthened if it is directly followed 
by a mute and then a liquid in that order. What do these words mean? Well, a mute is a consonant that's been created by stopping the flow of air by using the lips or the teeth or the palate. And then it's followed by a release of air. And in Greek, there are nine such letters that are mutes. Uh, three groups of three. These are the, the, the labial mutes, so the ones using the lips. These are the dental ones, so the teeth. And these are the palatal ones. And then the liquids, um, there are four letters which count as liquids. Lambda, mu, nu, and rho. And there's a very nice and useful way to remember these. It's the London, Midland, and Northern Railway. So, for example, in the word hopla, we've got a mute, P, and a liquid, uh, L. And that means that the Omicron is ANCEPS. We can either keep it short or we can lengthen it. Okay. Now let's move on to Homer. The meter of Homer, as with all epic poetry, is the dactylic hexameter. What does that mean? Well, first of all, a dactyl is a rhythmical sequence which is one long syllable followed by two short syllables. And the word means finger in Greek, and it's a good name because the length um, of the dactyl, metrically speaking, corresponds to the length of the bones in the human finger. So we've got a long followed by a short and then a short. And funnily enough, the Greek word dactylos is itself scanned as a dactyl. The alpha is long because we've got two consonants which are not mute and liquid. Uh, the upsilon happens to be short and the omicron is short by nature. Now hexameter means six times, so hex, the meter, in our case dactyls. And we call each of these six parts feet. So a dactylic hexameter is a line comprising of six dactylic feet. Here we go. One, and two, and three, four, five, six. Now that would be really easy to scan and probably quite boring. It's actually more interesting than that because a double short can contract into a long, thereby giving a spondy, the double short. And this always happens in the last foot. The last foot always ends long and then ankets. In the other feet, we can get spondies as well. In the fifth foot, however, it's quite rare. That's why I'm putting it in brackets. It only occurs maybe every uh, one in every 18 lines of Homer on average, uh, do we find a spondy in the fifth foot. So that means that most lines end dum diddy dum dum, or as matricians like to say, strawberry jam pot. And then once we've got to strawberry jam pot, the meter begins again. And the number of syllables in a line of Homer can be anywhere between 12 so assuming five lots of spondies and then the six foot long ankeps, or 17, assuming five lots of dactyls and then the long and ankeps. So if you find fewer than 12, if you find more than 17, something's gone wrong somewhere. Generally, the lines are a mixture of dactyls and spondies, so you'll get somewhere between 12 and 17. Now, let's scan a couple of lines of Homer from Iliad book three. What I'm going to do is I'm going to divide the line up into six feet. These feet have to be either dactyls or spondies. I'm going to start by looking carefully for words, for, for syllables rather, that I know are long. And I'm going to try to go from the start of the line, so from the first foot through to the end, to the, to the sixth foot. But if I ever find that I'm unsure somewhere in the middle about the length of um, one of the vowels, it can be a good idea to scan the last two feet, so the strawberry jam jam, and then work backwards from there. That can be useful. So stop the video now if you want to have a go, and then compare your answer when you're ready with mine. Here we go. So I've got 
an omega at the start of this line here. So I'm going to stand that as long. And then I've got an epsilon, which is short by nature. It's only followed by one consonant, so it's got to be short. And that means that the next uh, syllable, the alpha, that's got to be short. Because if you get one short, you've got to get two shorts. Okay? You either get two shorts in a row, or you don't get any shorts. If you find you've only got one short, or if you find that you've got three shorts in a row, or four, or whatever, you've got a problem. That can't be right. You either come in pairs, or they don't come at all. You've either got a dactyl, or you've got a spondy. So I know that I've got a dactylic first foot. I'm looking at the second foot now. I've got an epsilon. That's short by nature, but it's followed by two consonants. Therefore, it's going to be lengthened. Um, here, an omega, that's long. So I've got a spondaic second foot. And then I've got a diphthong here at the beginning of the third foot, followed by an epsilon, short by nature. Only one consonant follows. So that's got to be short, which means the alpha's also got to be short. Uh, into the fourth foot with an eta, that's long. Uh, an epsilon, that's short. That tells us that the alpha of mega has got to be short. And then we've got to the strawberry jam jam. Enjoy your meal. Right, and then the next line. We've got here, yeah, again, we've got an epsilon, but it's followed by two consonants, which are not mute and liquid. That's got to make it long. Okay, then in the second foot, we've got a dactyl. And then we've got a spondy. And then we've got, okay, I don't yet know what, whether the alpha is long or short, but I do know that the epsilon is short. And that helps me know that the alpha's got to be short. Working backwards. Okay. And then strawberry jam pot. So, there you go. Um, there are a few more things to add. First of all, the main cisure. A really important thing to note is that a line of dactylic hexameter is really made up of two parts. A slightly shorter part followed by a slightly longer part. And they're separated by a main cisure. This is a Latin word which literally means a cutting. The line is cut between two and it's cut at a place between two words. And every line has got a main cisure. 98% of the time the main cisure is in the third foot. It either happens in the third foot after the first long syllable and that is called a strong cisure or it happens after the first short syllable of the third foot and that is called a weak cisure. The other 2% of the time, you'll find it after the first long syllable of the fourth foot. So for the lines that we've just done, I'll put in the cesura and say what kind we have. Um, in the first line here, I can see a word break here after the et of alte. That's a weak cesura. I'm going to put a W there for weak. And then in the next line, I can see a break between the words, between, uh, well, eon and proon. Um, that's after the first long of the line. That's got to be a strong zero. I'm putting in an S. Next thing is hiatus. Hiatus is what happens, that's the name we give, to when a word that ends in a vowel is directly followed by a word beginning with a vowel. The Greek tries to avoid this. That's why we have elision. But for various very interesting linguistic reasons that I can't go into here. There are loads of places in Homer where there is still hiatus. Now, when you get hiatus, it can happen that a long syllable at the end of a word can be shortened before the next word that begins with a vowel. And this is called corruption. Sounds like corruption, but corruption. And... Um, corruption means again, yes, this long vowel at the end before hiatus can become shortened. Also, it can stay long. It's not a rule, it's a tendency. The tendency is corruption does happen when you get hiatus, but there are loads of exceptions. Now, that's what I meant earlier when I said earlier that diphthongs can sometimes be shortened. This is when it happens in corruption. Um, like I said, hiatus is really common in Homer. You really need to be on your guard 
uh, to see whether it will lead to corruption or not. I've got an example here from line 190 of Iliad 3. Um, stop the video now if you want to have a go at doing the line and then start it again in a second. Here we go. So here I've got a diphthong in U, so that's got to be long. Um, that's a spondet first foot and then in the second foot I've got long and then I've got a short by nature that's only one consonant so it's got to be short um, and then I've got an instance of hiatus a word ending in a vowel a word beginning with a vowel no elision that's hiatus I've also got another instance here of exactly the same thing another hiatus now like I said what can happen is that a long vowel can become short via the process of corruption that has to be the case here because it's not possible to have just one short you either get two or you don't get any so here corruption has happened we've got a dactylic second foot third foot begins with a long and then I don't know yet what the alpha is, it could be long or short, but I do know that the omicron has got to be short because it's followed by only one consonant, which means that therefore the alpha must be short too. I've got a weak cisura here in the third foot, and then in the fourth foot, well, where it was started the foot, and whether you've got a dactyl or whether you've got a spondy, the first part of the foot is always long. So here what we've got is we've got an instance of hiatus which did not lead to corruption. The oi remains long and then we've got a dactyl in the fourth foot and then we're into the strawberry jam jam at the end. There are two more things that I'd like to look at. Um, first of all, something called synesthesis. This crops up every now and then. And synesthesis is when you've got two vowels sitting next to each other which do not form a diphthong. And they melt together to form one syllable. And when this happens, generally the first of the two vowels is typically an epsilon. The second of the two is typically a long syllable, like maybe um, an omega. Um, have a go at this line here. Pause the recording for a second while you have a go, and then when you're ready, start it off again. I'm going to scan it. I've got a spondaic first foot. This has got to be short, because it's short by nature, and followed only by one consonant. Therefore, the alpha must be short. So we've got a dactylic second foot and then we're at the beginning of the third foot like I said at the beginning of every foot you've always got a long syllable but here I've got an epsilon that's short by nature so what's happened well what's happened here is we've got an instance of synesthesis and what we do is the two melt together into a long and we don't uh, we, we denote visually the presence of synesthesis by using a sort of upside down sublinear arch so we do that underneath which shows that we've got synesthesis okay after that it's easy we've got a spondaic third foot with a strong caesura um, and then we've got the epsilon short by nature however it's at the beginning of the fourth foot therefore it has to be lengthened it's lengthened before the mutant liquid here and then uh, here's the rest strawberry jam pot that was the first thing. The second and final thing um, is this. Um, it's that um, certain short vowels can be lengthened in certain circumstances. For example, a short vowel towards the end of a word that comes before a sigma or a nu or a rho can be lengthened when the following word begins with a vowel. Have a little go at this line here. Pause the recording and start it again when you're ready. Kerux, that's got to be a spondaic first foot. I know that. I know that the upsilon has got to be scanned long because 
the xi is a double consonant. So spondi here. Um, I don't yet know, well, I do know that the iota of idaios has to be long because it's at the start of the foot. Um, then we've got a diphthong, I. And then we're at the beginning of the third foot. And we've got a vowel that's naturally short by nature, followed by one consonant. But it needs to be long. And what's happening here? Well, it's this rule. Okay, it gets lengthened. Then we have a spondaic third foot with a strong severe. In the fourth foot, the naturally short epsilon is lengthened by the double consonant here. It's mutant liquid. Um, the upsilon is long. And then the strawberry jam pot. And in a very similar way, a word ending with a short vowel may also be lengthened before a word which starts with London Midland Northern Railway or with Sigma. So for example here we've got a dactyl in the first foot, here we've got an instance of hiatus however it does not lead to corruption because we're at the start of the foot. Um, we've got another dactyl and then we're here. Again, at the start of the foot, it's got to be long. We have a, a vowel here that's short by nature. It gets lengthened under this process with mu, nu, rho, lambda, and sigma. Um, not always, but here it does. It's almost as if the line was spelled like that. Te megalem with a double M, um, which makes it longer. And that's the rest. So, I would say, if you can apply all of these techniques, then you should be able to scan most lines of Homer. It might take a while at first, but please believe me, with practice you will speed up and it's really satisfying. Now, if you're keen, I have supplied a short passage of Homer for you to scan in your own time, and I've also supplied the answers to the passage. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you're interested, I've made another one about how to scan iambic trimeters. You can find it, along with many other videos, on our website, www.weeksummerschool.org. Thank you very much for watching.